Welcome, welcome. We are so glad everyone is here. So for those of you who joined us last week on uh, for our session on what school boards do, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time this week, welcome. We are so glad you're here. One of the things we talked about last week about one of the main roles of a school board member um, is that they represent you, the community, and so therefore they should hear from you and they should listen to you when they're making their decisions. So that's why tonight we're going to be talking about how to write a compelling speech to give at a school board meeting. I'm Elisa Hoffman. Um, I was elected to the Cincinnati Public School Boards here in Ohio back in 2013. While I was a school board member, I chaired the policy committee and led the process to author one of our first equity policies in the country. And then in 2018, I founded an organization called School Board School. We also have Maya Bird here with us. Um, she is our director of programs and communications at School Board School. She's a former classroom teacher, and she was part of our third School Board School class. And we also have a current school board member with us here tonight. We have Nidhi here with us tonight. She is a scientist committed to merging voices and values with scientific knowledge to elevate communities. That sounds pretty awesome. And she currently works as a senior research optometrist at The Ohio State University and was elected to the Upper Arlington Board and began her four-year term in January of 2022. So got lots of great expertise in the room tonight. So that's who we have leading our session tonight. Now let's go over our objectives so we know what we want to accomplish. We got two things we want to do tonight. Um, we hope that you all will be confident in your ability to speak at a school board meeting during hearing of the public about an issue that's important to you. And we also hope you'll leave and believe that your school board members are representatives of the community, and so they should listen to and value your input before they make decisions. No matter what your role is in the community, we know if you're here tonight, you most likely have an issue that's important to you and you want your school board to hear. We know that attending a school board meeting is a great first step. It really helps you get the lay of the land. It gets you to see who some of the key players are in your district. It also lets you hear how other constituents go to the mic and what they have to say and how they say it to your school board. So it's a great way to learn about how to do a really compelling um, speech at a school board meeting. So speaking of those compelling speeches, I'm gonna pass it over to Maya now so she can lead us through how you all can make some really compelling speeches. Thank you, Elisa. So we're gonna spend our time together talking about hearing of the public or that two to three minutes which you can give at a school board meeting. And we'll, um, I'll tell you that I spoke at a school board meeting for the first time in 2021. So even as a classroom teacher, I hadn't known how the school board worked or made decisions. It was after I had gone through a school board session like this one with Robert and Blue that I felt like I understood how the board worked and I had the confidence to speak up. So I asked my board how they plan to use American Rescue Plan funds and to give a public report to the community because I'd heard a lot about so much money that was coming into my district, but I hadn't heard how it would be spent or how we know whether or not it was effective. So that's why I chose to speak at my school board meeting. Why are we spending time on this topic, getting you ready to speak? Well, the board is supposed to be the voice of the community. So the board's main job is listening to and reporting to you, and they should hear from you. So we're gonna talk about what makes a two to three minute speech to the board called hearing of the public, or it might be called testimony. What makes it compelling? We're gonna chat in a link to a handout. It's gonna prompt you to make a copy. You can do that and it'll be yours forever. You can keep it. And you're gonna check out the tips chart on page two of your handout and the tips that continue on the next page. So these are just some great tips for preparing testimony. And you'll see that lots of them are about appealing to common ground and not starting with anger or attacking language. So at School Board School and at Red, White, and Blue, we believe that equity and inclusion are core to the work that needs to be done in our school districts. And we know there's an organized effort in school districts across the country to push us backward when it comes to building school systems where every student, staff member, and family is safe and valued. Those aren't the only dis issues in districts, though, where people have strong feelings. There are so many other issues that you may have very strong feelings about and where the actions of the board are opposing what you believe is the right decision to make. 
So we know people come to the microphone passionate about everything from how their child's IEP is to how it's being implemented to concerns over funding, like I spoke about, to extracurriculars, everything in between. So we get it. You may want to get to the microphone and give those board members a piece of your mind. We're here to tell you that might make you feel better, but it won't actually help move anything forward. No one likes to be yelled at. Board members are people, and it's hard for them to hear you when you're insulting them. So as it says on our handout, we want to model the behavior we expect in our elected officials and that we want students to see. So we say at school board school often, relationships are the work. If you truly want to make sustainable change in your districts, you have to build those relationships and that credibility. And you'll do that much more effectively in the long term if you come to the microphone respectfully. Even when, or especially when, you disagree. So you should start by introducing yourself and thanking them for their service. This is a really hard and often thankless job. So starting by a simple thank you, you'll be surprised how far that will get you. You wanna be sure you have a clearly defined ask the board. So they can't help you if you're just there generally saying something is bad. This is a place where you can appeal to that common ground. So for example, instead of just saying, I'm concerned that their great reading scores drop since the pandemic, that's your concern. You could say, I know you share my concern about very great reading scores. I brought a printout of research on high impact tutoring, and I'm hoping the board and the superintendent will review this research and that you'll consider implementing this model and the board will consider funding you. One other really important point to make is that your story is what will move people. Data matters, but stories are what people remember. So be sure to explain how you're personally connected to this issue. We saw in the poll, so many of you are concerned community members, parents, caregivers. You wanna show that personal connection. So you might say, my son was a first grader during the height of COVID. First grade is fundamental to learning to read. And he did first grade virtually, which is not ideal for a six-year-old. We know he's behind where he should be and we're struggling to figure out how to help. This tutoring could be a game changer for him and for other kids like him. So those are a couple of key points for compelling testimony. And I wanna hit on finding common ground one more time because it's so important. I know many of you may be in districts where people are literally saying things like, I don't believe in equity. And we're over here trying to tell you to find common ground. I know it's hard to wrap your head around, but people saying those things also believe that what they're fighting for is in the best interest of kids. So we can be completely opposed on the issues and still agree that we all want what's best for kids. And so finding common ground in this case can just be saying that, acknowledging that there's differences, but then make statements no one can disagree with and more to the point, something you can actually agree with. So for example, if you say, when I send my child to school, I think I want the same thing you do for them to be safe, for them to get the support they need to gain the knowledge and skills they'll need to be successful in life. I think Bye. that's what every parent wants. Then you can remind them that it's their job to do that. Like as a school board member, it is their job to educate every child in the district. And then you can state the issue that you want them to focus on. So we're not trying to be Pollyanna here or naive to just how difficult it is to talk with and work with many school board members in your districts. But we have to start somewhere and with something you can hold them accountable for. That also means you can't just show it once. You have to keep coming back, talking about the same issue. So we're gonna watch an example of good testimony, but before we do that, I wanted to hear from Dr. Nithi. Dr. Nithi, you've been on the board during some very intense times. 
what advice would you give about how to connect with board members during a hearing of the public if constituents want to move real work forward? So what have you seen be really effective and what's not as effective? Yeah, so I want to start with um, just thanking everyone for being here. Becoming more active and engaged in our community is is the heart of participatory democracy. And I just think that is so critical. And so thank you all for being here from all around the nation and even those of you who are in my school district. Um, I think the key part of your question, Maya, is how to connect with school board members during public participation. That word connect. When you come up to the mic and you speak to us, you connect with us. Our children are in the same schools. We're neighbors. We walk dogs together. We see each other at the grocery stores. We are your local representatives. And so connecting with us, I think, is the most important part of what you shared. And you can connect with us in different ways. You can connect with us personally, um, but also like you mentioned, Maya, when you come repeatedly to the microphone, when you come month after month and you make a reasonable request, you make reasonable statements, you are not only concerned about your own child, which we all understand, your child is the heart of your world. I get it. My children are the heart of my world, even when they walk into my meetings. Um, they're our children. We love them. And I get it. And our job as school board members is so important that we are looking at every student. And so if you can take the story of your child and connect it with the stories of other children, I think that has a really strong impact. Um, the other part of your question is what's really effective. I think there are a lot of different things that can be effective. Again, it all ties back to that common ground that you mentioned um, and really talking about the things that none of us want. I'm thinking of an example of a young woman who came and spoke with us. She's actually a student at our high school. Um, she's, a, she's a black woman and she came in and she shared stories of walking into the school building and being greeted um, by fellow students with monkey sounds and how much that hurt her. And I mean, that's a story that I will, I will carry that with me. Um, it was so traumatic and so compelling as a school board member, this is something we need to address urgently. You know, um, yes, we can talk about our budget. Yes, we can talk about the business of running a school, but we are all here for the kids. And so hearing an emotional story like that is certainly one um, that is compelling, that will create that sense of urgency that we want. Um, but I think also finding ways to build that common ground. We had a speaker come just last month and he, talked about how we are not a divided community. And just by starting with that piece, that that piece that is unexpected. And he went on to say, you know, we all want the best for our children. And this is these are things that we come together over. And so I thought his speech was also incredibly powerful because he's building that common ground. He's connecting with us as school board members. So I think there are different ways that you can connect with school board members, even if you don't know them personally. Um, but those are just some of the thoughts that I have and, and how to really be effective at the microphone. Hey, Alyssa, would you uh, mind if I just interject for just one moment? You talked about a little bit about something that I feel very passionate about, and that is showing people their humanity and knowing that this is a spectrum and that um, we're all learning along the way. And so... I just want to hear a little bit more from you about like nobody's ever going to be like the most diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice professional ever. Like we're all on a journey and we all live intersectional, multi-issue lives and all politics are local and you, you really kind of... um stung me a little bit because I was like oh I gotta get better at this or that or whatever and we all have biases that we're overcoming and so how would you say folks should get started in even confronting their own biases or internalized racism even those are some great questions um, internalized racism is is true for all of us um, there are so many ways to start in that journey uh, there is a really great tool that's put out by the Smithsonian um, that's about racial identity and the spectrum of racial identity development. And so I, that's a tool that I reference often. I can throw it, throw it in the chat here in a little bit. 
um, but it talks about really our development on our racial identity journey. And it breaks it up into two different groups. It breaks it up into if you are a member of the global majority or if you are a member of, of the global minority um, and what that path looks like and how it, you know, it starts from a place of I don't see color to a place of strong allyship or it starts from a place of really valuing and centering the experience of the of, of the white population as with the gold standard, right? Like the gold standard for beauty being white standards or the gold standard for etiquette being white standards. And, and it moves into a celebration of your own culture and a valuing of your own culture. And so I think those are some really um, powerful tools that I have found. Um, to talk about implicit bias, I think that Harvard implicit bias test, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. I can throw that in the chat as well. Um, that I think is a very powerful um, test. And there are many different tests there. I actually just took one yesterday um, about Asian Americans and whether we see Asian Americans as Americans or if we see them as foreigners. And just going through that self-awareness piece of identifying whether or not you think um, whether or not you think you have these biases, we all have them. It's a part of our culture. And so recognizing that we're on that journey, um, and I did wanna take a step back and, and talk about you know, your comment about wanting to be better in all areas. We are all human. And when you come and speak to us, you don't need a perfect three minute speech that ends at two minutes and 59 seconds with a round of applause and anything like that, right? Just speak from the heart, connect with us. Um, and again, keep in mind that it, our job is to help every student and certainly some individual students' experiences impact every student, right? If we address the student who came and spoke to us uh, last month or two months ago, if we address her issue, that helps every single student. And so in that case, helping one student helps every student, um, but also recognizing that that's not always the case. And so we always have to keep in mind um, what's best for all of our students in the building. So we're going to move on to the Absolutely. good example of a testimony together and talk about what made it compelling. So we're going to play a clip and you can jot down some notes in your handout in the section on page three about a compelling example. And we'll chat in the link to the handout again in case you missed it while we're getting the screen up to play the clip. Two weeks ago, I received ISS for having my nails painted and was told that I would stay in ISS until I removed them, simply because the policy only applied to males. I got my education taken away from me for something as minor as painting my nails because it's against the dress code. The question I pose is why? Why is it against dress code for a man to be comfortable with his masculinity and defy the gender norms that society has imposed on us? Better yet, in what way is it harmful for me wearing nail polish? If it's not harmful for girls to wear it, then why is it harmful for males? Discrimination is singling out a single group or person for treatment that is different and unfair. The rule only applies to males, making it not only discriminatory, but very sexist. I've gone to Clyde almost my whole entire life, and this is not what we are about. The people of Clyde are better and can do better. The board, the district, the teachers are supposed to provide a safe, accepting community for all students, regardless of race, sex, sexual orientation, and et cetera. Having a double standard like this only, show, only shows that Clyde doesn't accept kids for who they are. And they shouldn't be themselves because the very people that are supposed to create a safe environment can't <laughs> accept them. Clyde doesn't want to be known as the school that discriminates, and I know that in my heart. The future students around here need to know that they are accepted and that their concerns matter. They need teachers who will guide them to not only an awesome education, but an awesome and accepting environment, not people who care more about nail polish than they do their students. I know that the reflections of one should not include all others, but with issues arising 24-7 at school, at what point does it end? I understand that there are rules in life and I may not agree with it, that I may not agree with. But removing a child's freedom of expression in their most crucial years should not be the way to show this. In the real world, people are going to disagree with you and everything isn't going to go your way. All things that I've been told and knew prior to and through this. But this isn't about getting my way. It's about a matter of right or wrong and it is about following the law. It's because of people like Martin Luther King Jr., Susan B. Anthony, Cesar Chavez, and Sarah Deer, who all advocated for the rights of black people, women, Mexican Americans, and victims that oppressive and discriminatory systems have started to change. It's not too late to be on the right side of history, and I dare ask you guys to join. 
I understand that you guys have traditional values and I respect that, but to get respect, you also have to give it. America is progressing. We're staying up to date with the trends. We're modernizing as a whole and nothing will stop that. Traditional values are great, but change is inevitable. At what point do we look at the bigger picture and realize that this isn't 50 years ago? We are all supposed to be equal. Not having our freedom of expression suppressed, not having our voices not heard because grown-ups are taking three steps back instead of forwards. There's a certain beauty and uniqueness, and no one should have that taken away. Diversity is what makes this country so beautiful. From politics all the way to preferred pizza is a, different, is a spectrum of different opinions, all of which are valid. So what did you find compelling about that clip? Did anything stand out to you? Go ahead and put it in the chat. What stood out to you? Did you hear anything in Needy's response of building relationships, connecting personal connections, emotions? It was very authentic. Yeah, it was a genuine kind of first person. Well prepared, calm, lots of examples, spoke from his heart, composed, can't wait for him to be old enough to vote. <laughs> It was so personal. Self-reflection. I like that. Yeah. Warm. He was passionate. Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was also, I, I heard some common ground in there. I heard some, you know, bringing everybody together. He appealed to kind of every kid's right to be able to learn the way they do best. So yeah, he started with his personal story. I like that. Yeah, he started with his story, like Dr. Nithi was saying. And then he expanded it to connect it to other kids in the district. So you can also mention that he wasn't adversarial. He was firm, like he was direct, but he wasn't attacking anyone. He wasn't being aggressive. So we're going to move into the writing our own testimony part of the section, and I'm going to Move it over to Elisa. All right. Thanks so much, Maya. At School Board School, we talk a lot about how we're not learning just to learn, right? We all have real problems in our community. I'm seeing lots of you writing them in the chat right now. And so we're here tonight to learn and then apply what we're learning to take some action to help solve those problems in our community. And one of those actions you can take is speaking at a school board meeting. And so we're going to spend some time now going over an example, another example of a compelling testimony, and then you're either going to start drafting your own or just listen to how you draft a really compelling testimony. So again, like I said at the beginning, you know, if you're in a place where you can participate, please do. If you're in a place where you can just listen, that's great. You'll learn a lot there too. Um, and just to be clear, our intention here isn't that, you know, in the next you know, 28 minutes, you're going to have a perfectly polished testimony ready to go. Um, the idea here is that you're going to get something down on paper tonight that you can revise when we all hang up. Um, and that you'll also get a chance to really learn about the process of going through to write one of these so you can have confidence going to your board um, and speaking at one of those meetings. So let's go ahead and dive in. So if you have your handout, go ahead to page three. And you can see on page three of your handout, there are a couple of little kind of bullet points there about the parts of a compelling testimony. So this is what Maya just went over, right? You introduce yourself, including your connection to the school district. You thank those school board members and the administrators who are there. Um, you find some common ground, then you clearly articulate your issue. And then as you said in the chat over and over again, you connect personally with the issue. And then you have to make that specific ask, right? Um, so we are going to read through an example that follows this format. So you have another example here of a compelling testimony. Um, so you can check out the sample testimony that's on page three towards the bottom of your handout. It starts with, hello, my name is Jane. So we know not all of you are in a place to read this right now. So Maya, can you read us this compelling testimony like you were at a school board meeting? So it should take Maya about three minutes to read through Jane's testimony. Hello, my name is Jane. And I'm the parent of a third grader at Washington Elementary School. Go Sharks! I want to thank you for being school board members and district administrators. Your jobs are hard at any time and especially hard in recent years. I know a lot of us in this room may have ideological differences on a lot of issues that matter to us, but I think where we all agree is that we want what's best for kids in our district. I know that when I send my child to school, I think I want the same thing you do for your kids, for them to feel safe and for them to get the knowledge and skills they'll need 
to be successful in life. I think that's what every parent wants. As our elected school board members, it's your job to make sure that every child in our district gets an education that allows them to reach their potential. That's a big job. We have a lot of real education issues in our district. One issue that I'm concerned about, and many of us here tonight are also concerned about, is that our third grade reading scores have gone down significantly. We know we had the pandemic year and we're still dealing with the impacts of the pandemic, but I think we all agree that our kids still need to know how to read. My son was a first grader during the height of COVID. First grade is fundamental to learning to read and he did first grade virtually, not ideal for a six year old. We know he is behind where he should be, and we are struggling to figure out how to help. I know I'm not the only parent concerned about this. There are six of us here tonight all concerned about this issue. You can see my group sitting together all wearing green shirts. We also know that everyone in the district is stretched thin. So we're also here to say that we're willing to help if you need it. What we're asking from you is that we wanna hear from you about what the district administration's plans are for helping ensure our kids that get back on and stay on track and how you as board members will allocate the funding for the administration's plans to make sure our kids aren't continuing to fall behind. We'd like to see these plans and the funding allocations at public meetings, including how you all are looking at the data, what your interventions are and how it's being paid for. I've left my contact information so you can follow up, including if there are ways we can help as parents and concerned community members. We look forward to working with you on the academic issues facing our kids, starting with ensuring our third graders can read. Thank you, Maya slash Jane, uh, for reading that one for us. Okay, so you can see how it hits on each of the bullets about what makes a compelling testimony, right? So the next section of your handout breaks the speech down into each of those sections with prompts and then room for you to start drafting your testimony. So in the rest of our time tonight, we are going to focus on parts four, five, and six. So we're going to start with part four. It's on page five of the handout. And we're going to take a minute to think about an issue or a concern that you have that you want to talk to your school board about. So this could be anything from, you know, we desperately need a new middle school. Our kids are like sitting on top of each other, and that is not an environment where they can learn. Um, or, you know, at one of my recent school board meetings, someone came to talk about how she works with kids experiencing homelessness, and many of them were not getting the transportation that they're legally required to get. So thinking about what topic it is that you want the district to address. I know sometimes it's hard to just kind of think of these off the top of your head. So um, Nidhi, is there, you know, could you call out a couple topics you've heard people come to speak to your board about? Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, D and I is certainly an issue right now, CRT, the boogeyman. Um, also book bans is something that has been a topic in our school board meetings lately. Um, I liked I liked earlier how you were talking about um, specific scores, so like the reading, the third grade reading guarantee, and then tying that back to a personal. So it could be academic achievement in the buildings. It could be feelings of exclusion or belonging. Um, I think there's a lot of different topics that are on people's minds these days. What is an issue you would like your to address with your school board? So think about what brought you to this session tonight, or what's something you're concerned about. So go ahead and think about that for a minute. And then I see people are already starting to chat them in. So go ahead and jot it down in box four on your handout so you don't forget it. And also chat it in so we can see what's on people's minds. Yep, so funding, yes, that's a great one. Um, ethnic studies, putting SEL back in our schools, the reading levels, that one comes up that I was just at one of my district school board reading uh, meetings and somebody talked about that, that the reading specialists were being cut. Mental health, oh, absolutely everywhere. Food allergy awareness, that's such an important one. Yes, my son has these food allergies too and I, it's something that absolutely should be brought up too. Yep. Yes, banning pride, Black Lives Matter signs. These are all such important issues. So make sure you jot this down in part four of your guide. So you have it and you can take it with you. Keep chatting those in. 
And um, you can go back to that part after we're done tonight and kind of build that out, you know, according to what we have in the guide here. But that at least gives you an idea of what it is you want to go to your board and talk about. But for right now, let's go ahead down to part five, where you connect personally to this issue. So as you heard us say over and over again, it's your personal connection that's going to matter the most here. That's what's going to have your school board members, like Nidhi was saying, she kept that story with her, right? Like those are going to be the stories that stick with your school board members is when you make it personal. And so in the example Maya read, right, she talked first generally about all third grade reading scores, but then she started talking about her own son. And we all could get that. We remember seeing these six-year-olds with iPads day in and day out during COVID, right? You see that image. And it's a way to connect this big issue to you personally. Um, and so, yeah, we'd love, Nidhi, again, if you could just share an example, if you can think of one as someone who spoke at your meeting and made that really personal connection. So another example that comes to my mind is, is actually a generational example. Our community is one where we have lots of families who've been here for multiple generations. And so we had a parent come and speak to us about his experience in a Burlington schools um, probably about 30, 30 years ago, and what it was like for him as a black student, as one of the only black students in the building at the time. And then 30 years later for his two children who identify as black um, and what their experience was like. And he talked about some of the differences and also some of the similarities. And so talking about the way things have changed, but also how much more we need to go, how further we need to get, how much further we need to go. Um, so I think that was also another example of a powerful one because you're now you're connecting with alumni, you're connecting with current students, you're connecting with school board members, you're connecting with um, members of the community who are marginalized. And so you're just connecting with a lot of different people. So I thought that was another example of a really compelling statement. That, that's a really, that's a great connection. Um, and so I think, you know, thinking about these connections, whether you're a community member, a staff member, a parent, right? So even Maya talked about how she went and spoke as a community member to our board about the ESSER funding. We know these education issues impact everybody in a community, not just, you know, people with kids in the district. And so being able to say, you know, this, the education of our kids impacts all of us, and yet we haven't been engaged in how to spend this money. And so really thinking about what's your connection to that district and, you know, how do you weave that into to the story you're going to tell? So let's all take a minute and in box five, jot down why the issue you put in box four matters to you. So why does it matter to you? Jot it down in box five and then copy and paste it into the chat. We'd love to see why you're compelled to talk about some of these things. We know we're the, the silent majority, right? We can't be silent. We know there's more of us who want what we're talking about, that every kid feels safe. So making those connections. Um, yes, spoken about how your local board impacts your neighborhood. There's, I mean, we just did a panel at School Word School about this, about how healthy schools and healthy neighborhoods are interconnected and you can't have one without the other. That's so great. Yep. Oh, yes. Bull bullying and the moral responsibility to ensure every child's value. These are beautiful. So yes, please do keep jotting down in the chat and in box five, your personal connection to the issue. That again is going to be the most compelling part of your testimony. Um, and then the last part we want to talk about tonight is uh, thinking about your ask, right? So, you know, in the sample, the ask was for a plan from the administration um, and for how the board was going to fund some of this work around third grade reading. We know this one can be a little tricky. Sometimes you're like, I just... I'm just mad about this thing. I don't know what my ask is, right? But like Maya said before, if you just show up and complain, they, they can't really do anything. Um, and so you need to know what are you asking them for? What would you want to see them actually do? And so again, Nithi, we'd love to hear just if you have in your seat as a school board member, just heard anyone make that really good connection between this is the thing I came here to talk about. Please do this thing. I think the example that Maya read earlier was was really a great example, but really anything specific. And so if it's AP, AP courses, that might be another topic, um, enrollment in AP courses, my student, you know, you can talk about the statistics of how many students are taking AP courses in your district, and then you can tie it back to yourself, like to your own student. My student felt mm -hmm. ready for this AP course. Or this AP course really helped my student when they graduated. If you have, if you're a parent of alums, 
of alums um, or my student didn't feel prepared and this is how the teachers helped them feel prepared for that AP course or my student was really nervous and we decided not to do an AP course. Hmm. So there's so many different ways that you can take it, um, whatever the topic is, whatever the one piece of data that you want to talk about is um, shared, you can connect with it in so many different ways. Yeah, and I'll say too, at a recent school board meeting we were at um, when there was a parent talking about she was talking about the re uh, reading specialists were going to be cut from their school. Um, we all know this ESSER funding is, is it's going away. It's not here forever. And so some schools are already seeing those positions being cut. But she talked about how the impacts of COVID we're just seeing on so many of the kids who are in supposed to be in preschool and how behind her kid, her youngest kid is compared to her older ones. And her specific ask was, we've got to find a way to keep these reading specialists at least for the next few years. So she didn't just say my kid's behind, you know, but she really had that specific ask. So that is such an important part. And so again, we're gonna just take a minute and let you think about, think about the issue you said you wanted to address. What's your ask? What do you want your board to do? Go ahead and jot it down in part six. Um, I do see some people chatting and things like they're gonna be asking for a policy change. That's so important. That's like the big job of school boards is to create and amend policy. And so if there's something that can be addressed by policy, that is a really perfect ask. Their other big job is around budgets and finances. So if there's something that should be in their budget that's not, that's another really important ask. Um, so those are really great ways to ask your board to do something about the issue you care about. Um, so, uh, hopefully, you each now know the issue you want to talk to your school board about, you know why it's important to you, um, and then you know what it is you want to ask about. And so again, we'll say that, you know, after we wrap up tonight, while this is kind of still fresh in your head, we would suggest that you take just a couple of minutes and build these out and do it however works for you, however you write best. It could be you're going to put some bullet points under each one. It could be you're someone who scripts everything out. So you're going to write a script for yourself. But we also know we're all busy people. And as soon as you stand up from your Zoom and go off, you're going to have to, you know, make lunches for tomorrow or do that target run or pick up the house. And so before you kind of let yourself go to those things, if you can take 10 minutes and just continue to draft this, we know you'll have something really, really compelling for your next school board meeting. Um, and so hopefully everybody tonight feels like they understand the components of what makes a really compelling speech and that hopefully you even have a start to that speech. So I'm going to turn it over to Maya one more time. So many really great questions in the chat that I've just been um, having conversations with. Hopefully you got a good start on testimony you can use at your next school board meeting. So speaking of school board meetings, we have a session on May 1st that you all should come to. It's called Why School Boards Matter. We're going to be learning from three school board governance experts about how to hold school boards accountable to building more equitable and student outcome focused districts, which I think a lot of you guys were chatting in. How do we actually get to hold them accountable? How do we actually work with them? Um, and we'll chat in the registration link now, and we encourage you to sign up. We talked earlier about how we always want to learn in order to take action to support students in our community. So you now hopefully have a draft testimony where you know how to write one. Thank you, Dr. Nithi and all of you for joining us tonight and for the work you'll do in our school districts. Thank you for your amazing answers and questions. Again, please register for our May 1st session on why school boards matter. Thanks so much.